so my name is Tian. I'm currently working for ArcBlock uh, for building uh, the next generation um, uh, blockchain frameworks uh, for, for helping developers to, to build their decentralized apps as easy as possible. Uh, so today my talk is about building a decentralized public verifiable database uh, with uh, EXABCI and Tendermint. So uh, since uh, there's a lot of concept might be pretty new to you, so I will, I will focus a lot on the concept to make sure I explain the decentralization and public verifiable uh, correctly, and you can get those concepts. <clears throat> so the first very important question is why uh, do we need this term decentralization and public verifiable? Why does it matter to you? Because we have all kinds of internet applications, it works pretty well. Why do we need to uh, break them down and rebuild things again? Um, so take the code beam ticket as, a, as an example. So uh, everyone bought a code beam ticket uh, from Eventbrite or uh, you get your free ticket. Um, so we, we, we trust code beam because we, we know code beam. We have we previously have good experience with code beam. We trust Eventbrite because it is a kind of big company. We, we know probably it won't do evils, right? Uh, so we, we give our money to, to it. We hope Eventbrite will, will share the money to CodeBeam and CodeBeam will uh, issue a ticket to, to us so that we can use the ticket uh, to, to take the conference. So behind the, the scene, we are actually trusting uh, one, data is correct, we paid the money, and it, the database in Eventbrite actually record that fact. And the data is not compromised. I bought a ticket. Uh, it won't be written as someone else bought that ticket. And data is not lost. Uh, uh, no server crash, no data, no data lost, uh, so that I can use this ticket as a digital asset to verify that I own it. But what if, say, everything works well in this picture, and actually it is working pretty well. Let's say, what if? I have an emergency. Um, I can't attend the conference. I want to sell, resell the ticket. Uh, as Eventbrite didn't provide this kind of service, I cannot use Eventbrite to, to resell it. And uh, CodeBeam, of course, it won't provide such kind of service. It's, uh, it's the conference is the most important thing to, to it. So we need to, the help of some third party service. But, how can you trust those third-party service? And how can they explain your ticket? Because the data is in the Eventbrite server. They cannot easily um, explain those data well. Even if someone else is desperately want the ticket, say that all the ticket in the code beam sold out, uh, Alice want, want the ticket, and you want to sell the ticket, you, you guys know each other's requirement, but since you, you, you two don't have trust in each other, so you cannot make the exchange. Uh, the, the problem behind the scene is that uh, although you pay the money, you own the ticket, a digit asset, but the data of that ticket is not owned by you. It's owned by Eventbrite. And <clears throat> who can explain the data? It's Eventbrite. Who can verify the data? It's also Eventbrite. So even if you, you have this, uh, technically you are the owner of this digital asset, uh, you can do nothing on it. You cannot exchange it. You cannot uh, transfer it to, to some, someone else uh, as, as long as um, um, uh, Eventbrite didn't provide that kind of service. Right? Um, so how to solve that problem? Uh, the first. Thing, we can think about it. What about all those data is public verifiable? Which means everyone have the access of the fact that there's a digital asset, there's a ticket in somewhere, and someone owns it, and everyone can check the authenticity of that. So to achieve this goal, first of all, we, uh, we, we cannot trust any server someone else run, right? Uh, 
we, can, we should be able to easily to spawn a server and synchronize the fact and calculate uh, the state based on those facts and get the conclusion that this ticket belongs to who and what's its current status and what's the history of, of those data. So if you can do this, uh, then uh, it is very easy for you to build service uh, to exchange the ticket and everybody else Although they, they, they won't trust you, they can trust the data in this entire picture. So this is uh, an, an example why the uh, decentralization and public verifiable is very important. But how to achieve this? So the next part of this talk is mainly about how we can build a layered service uh, to ch achieve this uh, capability of public verifiable. Um, we know that by using the existing <coughs> technologies on database, uh, we cannot easily to achieve this. Say, uh, we want to use Postgres. Uh, even if I share the entire data of, of my Postgres instance uh, in the internet, and everyone, everyone else can replicate data from, from my instance, uh, they still cannot trust the data because I, those data is written by me. I can write whatever data into that database. You just blindly synchronize those data. So uh, I, I write wrong data, you synchronize the wrong data. So we need to find a way uh, to make sure from the very beginning the data is uh, verifiable. And all along the way uh, until the final state, the data is still verifiable. <clears throat> so to, to achieve this is uh, pretty complicated. First of all, uh, because it's um, in a decentralized network, we need a kind, uh, some kind of um, networking layer uh, to replicate the data. So uh, it could be peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, synchronization, it could be other method as long as uh, for Node, we can get the latest update about all the facts uh, on this network. And then I can calculate based on those facts to, to, to get the final state uh, of, of things I can trust. <clears throat> on top of it, uh, because we, we need to store the data, of course we need a data layer, uh, store the data, load the data. And uh, on top of it, we need some data structure to make sure all the data I return to the database is, can prove itself. So uh, if I say I write A, into this state. And in the same um, network, uh, other nodes in the same network, uh, they can, when, when they write the, the A into the database, they should get the same result as me. And then on top of it, uh, we need a consensus layer uh, to dis determine who is authorized to write in which order. So I, I will um, talk about that later. And finally, it's our business logic. If you want to uh, resell the ticket, this is something we need to build. So thanks to the open source commu community, most of the uh, parts, layers, below the, the transaction part uh, is solved by someone else. So we can leverage their existing technology to build this. Uh, but before we go further, before we get into the real code, we need to uh, go over some uh, concepts which may help you to understand the, the problem and understand the solutions. First of all, uh, the consensus part, who is authorized to write. So uh, since I assume most of you don't know blockchain much, so I, I will give uh, some very basic uh, concept on, on consensus. So uh, consensus, Consensus is, for, for a database, a consensus is about who can write what, in which order, into the database. So everyone, everyone is pretty familiar with the um, uh, distributed database like Postgres. So for Postgres, if you have multiple nodes, um, there will be one master. Uh, you will do a leader election to decide who is a master, and you will use two-phase two two, two commit uh, to make sure the data right into the database will, will, will not be lost 
and this data will replicate to the entire network. Uh, the good part for distributed database is that uh, the entire infrastructure is owned by you. So you, you have all the trust to all those nodes. So uh, you, um, a slave or a replica set can replicate whatever master told it to replicate blindly, right? It, it, need to, it, it didn't need to do any decision. Everything master, master told me is correct. So uh, consensus for distributed database is just for crash for tolerance, meaning the mas if master crashed, uh, another node can take over, become master, and the whole database uh, is functional. But in the decentralized world, uh, it is a lot different. Everyone can run a node uh, with your software, and you cannot trust uh, the data uh, you get because you don't know if this, uh, this, uh, this node gave, gave the data to you uh, is, is uh, authentic data or is um, fake data, right? So you need certain consensus algorithms, like the um, consensus used by Bitcoin, uh, proof of work, or the consensus used by Tendermint, uh, practical uh, Byzantine for tolerance. I, I, I will not go very detailed uh, into those consensus algorithms. It, it, uh, it needs another talk to, to really uh, make uh, it clear. But this is what uh, is required to do consensus for a decentralized uh, database. You need uh, some algorithm to make sure, even if the network has, um, has bad node, the, the whole network can still survive uh, at certain condition, meaning uh, if only uh, one th smaller than one third of nodes uh, is bad nodes, the network can still, the honest node can still survive. <clears throat> so the next concept is a block, uh, because a block is invented by a blockchain technology. So everybody talks about block, but most of the people doesn't really know what a block is. So uh, a block is actually a container to decide two things. One is how time is synchronized. The other is how transactions or how the data in inside that block are ordered. Um, we still use distributed database and decentralized database to compare. Uh, so for distributed database, there's no uh, concept of block because that is not needed. Master and leader can provide the global timer. So whatever master says uh, replicate this at this time, uh, the slave just blindly uh, replicate that. But for a decentralized database, block act as a tick to move the whole, whole network forward. For example, if you, you are a node, uh, you got the data uh, from the block height two, but at the, at the moment, you haven't applied the, all the transactions in, in block one. You cannot uh, move the network, uh, move your own state into block two. You need to wait for block one and apply those transactions and then goes to the ne next block. So every, everybody in, the, in a decentralized network has its own timer. So we cannot rely on the system timer, right? Uh, because everyone, uh, the timer for every node is uh, slightly different, even if uh, everybody is using the, uh, the time protocol to sync the time globally. Um, so the next one is how transactions are ordered. For distributed database, it is also not needed. Master uh, give you whatever data, you just write it. But for decentralized uh, database, uh, block acts as a container of transactions to make sure everyone, when it get this block, will process all the transactions one by one from top to bottom to make sure everyone else can compute the same result. So uh, for how to compute the same results, I'll, I'll uh, talk about it later. Uh, the next very important concept is a uh, transaction. So transaction is a fact that Potentially, potentially trigger state transit. So it, it tells about how state transit. First of all, it is a fact. It is not a state. A fact means something happened. A state means uh, because something happened, so my data is changed to this. So this is a fact and state. 
uh, let's think about uh, for distributed database. Um, it, the, the fact is actually is whatever the client told the database to write, right? So you, you, um, your Postgres client uh, give a command, say insert uh, into this table for this, this, this columns with th th these values, and the server just take uh, this command and execute it and write the data into the database. So it didn't verify if the fact is the true fact, right? It might be a fake news. Uh, for, for decentralized database, um, every data is signed by the, by the sender um, to make sure uh, the sender says, um, for example, the sender says, I will transfer 10 tokens to B. Then the sender needs to use its own private key to sign this message to make it a fact. And everyone in the network will verify the sender's signature is correct and compare the, the sender's balance uh, to make sure sender has, has so much tokens and apply it to, to the state database. So for decentralized uh, database, the fact, the transaction is very important because it described a fact. It's not uh, changeable because the sender signed, signed it with its private key. Everyone else got that fact. If it alter any part of that fact, uh, that, that signature will be invalid. So every node can, can say uh, this is um, a compromised fact, so I won't take that fact. So um, this is the um, most important difference uh, between the distributed database and decentralized database. And all uh, the consensus algorithms, the blocks, are served for, to make sure the transactions are applied in the same order in, in all the nodes across the network. So this is uh, the very minimum uh, concept uh, for consensus, and this is the foundation of blockchain technology or the de de uh, decentralized um, ledger technology, whatever. <clears throat> so um, think about the Eventbrite um, example. Um, on that example, we put our trust, our faith, uh, for, for the authority, so because we trust even bright, we do no evils, so we, tr we trust them. Uh, but in the decentralized world, we put our trust on math or al algorithms. We know that mathematically or cryptographically, this is unchangeable. If someone signs something, uh, that, that thing could be treat treated as a fact. <clears throat> so uh, with, with the, those minimum concept of consensus, uh, Let's talk a little bit about Tenement. Tenement is actually an, an open source project uh, that provides uh, PBFT consensus. And the good part of it is it has a very nice abstraction layer, separate the consensus and peer-to-peer -peer from application. So for your application, you don't need to worry about the consensus. You just trust uh, those code make the consensus work right and those codes will make the replica replication of the data uh, uh, correct. So what you need to do is, when uh, the Tendermint application sends you some message through TCP, you just process those messages correctly, and then uh, your application will have, the very, have, have a good foundation for, for public verifiable and decentralization. So it provides a, a, a list of uh, events for the application to listen to. So uh, for example, begin block, deliver transaction, end block, and con commit block. Those are the most important ones. And uh, since Tenement is written in Go, so if we want to use it, uh, we need to build our own um, library to use it easily uh, so that uh, everyone else doesn't need to uh, write directly against the TCP, uh, TCP server and those TCP messages. So we want to, um, in Erlen world, we want to work with message. So uh, the EXABCI uh, actually wrap the entire TCP server and put, the, um, put all those mess, uh, data into 
uh, wrapped messages so that you, you just need to handle begin block, handle deliver transaction. You, you just need to, to implement those callback functions and you are good to go. So uh, that, that is the uh, minimum concept for the consensus layer. So we know that to build a um, verifiable uh, database on consensus layer, we know that every fact is, um, uh, is uh, mathematically provable. It's self-provable. But we need to make sure our state, our data written, the data written in our database is self-provable so that I, I get a list of facts, I calculate those facts, and I update uh, the state in my database. So how can I prove that my state are the, the same as your state, right? Uh, if, if everyone else have, um, have a different uh, result after applying a list of transactions, then this network cannot survive because after working for a while, uh, everyone has their own data. You said this ticket is yours. I said this ticket is mine. So how can, how can um, uh, everybody trust on anything? So, um, so this state layer, the data structure that can prove itself is, is very important. Uh, so previously we talked about the fact, the fact is verifiable. So what about the state? Um, if you used uh, BitTorrent before, you know that if you download a very big movie, those movies are chunked to small chunks, and every piece of that chunk has a harsh, so that if a certain piece of, of a, a chunk is incorrect, incorrectly downloaded, you, you got that uh, information immediately. So this is, uh, um, this is um, uh, the very beginning use of the Merkle tree. So uh, we can chunk a big, big data, and every chunk we calculate it harsh. And every two uh, harsh, we can merge it to a new harsh. And the whole, whole state will aggregate to a root harsh. So I can just use this root harsh to prove the authenticity of the entire data. And uh, the good part of this structure is, uh, so some people may, may ask, uh, why, why just for the entire data, we, we, we give one harsh. So uh, the problem of that is, uh, if the harsh is incorrect, you cannot easily find out which part of the data is incorrect. So by, by using this Merkle tree structure, if say um, the, the entire hash is different, yours is different than, than, than mine, then uh, we can compare the, the hash below and find this hash is uh, different, and then we find this hash is different, then we know this data. Uh, either your data is incorrect or my data is incorrect. So it is very easy to find out which part of the entire state uh, is corrupted. So Merkle tree is uh, used widely uh, for data structures that can prove itself. Um, in Ethereum world, uh, the, because think about if you want to uh, uh, provide a verifiable database, so if it's a key value database, uh, what, what we, we will do for a key value database? We get a key, we put a key into the database, right? But the Merkle tree data structure is not uh, used for that purpose. Even if I can prove the data is correct, uh, I cannot use that fact to retrieve the data. So we, we want to, to find a way uh, to, by using this root harsh and as, the data, as a reference of the database, and then get, the, get a key from that, that database. So if we do this, we can make sure, uh, because we use this root harsh, I want to get this key, everyone from the network should get the same result. If not get the same result, some, something, some, something bad might happen. So Ethereum um, made this Merkle Patricia tree. So basically it make uh, a tree as a, as a map of the, of the data. You can, you can uh, go from the root harsh and 
uh, get uh, any key from this entire tree. So I, um, I don't have time to go into details of how the, those nibs and those leaves, leaves nodes are organized, but uh, underlying the structure of it is pretty similar as an early map. So let's compare a Merkle Patricia tree uh, with an early map. So we know that in early, uh, data structure is um, immutable. So for a map, actually internally, it's a persistent data structure. It, the representation of the map is actually a tree. So when we write a data into uh, this, ma this map, we will get a new root of this tree. So we have the old root, we have the new root. If we grab the, the new root, I can get the new keys from, from, the, from this tree, from this map. So this is a, a foundation of the, the map of the Erlen or, or Elixir. Um, in Erlen virtual machine, if we don't reference the old, um, old uh, map, so that, that reference will be garbage collected. And all the, all the unused nodes in that tree is dropped. But all the, all the nodes that reference by the new tree, because the new tree um, reuses most part of the old tree. So those parts are still uh, pers persist. A Merkle Patricia tree is pretty similar as this, but it records all the history, meaning it won't uh, drop all the old nodes. It just saved the old nodes into the database. I mean, you can, you, can, you can grab this root harsh and you get the, uh, a data from here. And if you want to um, get a new older version of this data, you can always go back to a certain root harsh. So that's a very powerful concept. And because it's also inherited the uh, Merkle tree, so which means all the data written in, in this tree converge to a root harsh. And this root harsh proves that it, it contains all those data. And all those data won't uh, be, be altered because if it's altered, the root harsh is different, right? So this is how it proved make it itself um, verifiable and uh, yeah. So uh, with those concepts, we can start building a decentralized public verifiable database. So um, first of all, we need to somehow um, the client can provide a fact to our server. We know that in the distributed database, the fact is insert into blah, 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 right? Uh, but there's no any verification inside this fact. Uh, but in a decentralized database, our data should be guarded with a signature. And everyone got this data, uh, will verify the signature is correct. If the signature is correct, then uh, the, the, data, the database shall start pro processing this data. So by, process, by processing this data, I mean, the data will be sent to the, to the Tendermint. And Tendermint will synchronize the data across the entire network. So everyone else will get this, this fact. And they will do the same thing to verify uh, the data is correct. And then um, across the network, someone will be a validator uh, at that time. And then that guy could propose a new block. And a new block contains a list of proved transaction so that uh, a Tendermint node will broadcast this block into the entire network and everyone start to, uh, to calculate those transactions. So this is the entire picture. By calculating each transaction, it may update the state DB, state DB by using the Merkle Patricia tree. And then um, everyone else uh, everyone will get a new root harsh, and it provides this root harsh uh, to the next block. So that when you got the next block, you compare the root harsh with your, against your root harsh to see if it's correct. If it's correct, you can start processing it. Uh, otherwise, it means uh, your node is screwed up. You might, you might need to start over again. Yeah. So, um, 
a little bit code here. So if we want to de define our transaction and the state, here is uh, some uh, example uh, by uh, protobuf. Like we can have a transaction which have from to total my public key and my signature. So when I send a transaction out, uh, I, will, I will calculate the hash from this part and put the signed signature against that hash to here, which uh, by, by that, uh, everyone got this transaction, uh, can prove that this transaction is signed by me. And um, in each database, in, in the database side, uh, we, we can store an account state uh, for its address, balance, and number of transactions. So there is a library called Merkle Patricia Tree. Uh, I encourage you to play with it. It's pretty easy just as using a map, but uh, it generated uh, public verifiable data. So there, there are two versions. One is level DB version. Uh, the other is the rocks DB version. Uh, I modified the, the or original version of it. So if you put put a hello, uh, uh, put a word to the key hello, uh, you will get a new uh, root hash of it. And you, when you retrieve that key, you can get the, the data. So uh, we talk about that a Merkle Patricia tree will, will store all the historical root hash into, um, into the database, which means you can do tr time travel. For example, uh, in time two, I update the hello to the word one, so I got another root hash. Uh, I can verify that uh, the database is updated. But if I put the original root, root, root hash uh, and try to retrieve data from that tree, then I get the older version of the data. So the entire history of the, the data is there. So it's it's not, uh, not only the data is provable in its final state, but in every state uh, in its life cycle, we can prove the, the correctness of it. So this is also very po powerful. So if we have, uh, we, we know how to update the state DB, then when Tendermint deliver a transaction to us, we just decode that transaction. We verify the, the transaction is correct. For example, if you want to send 10 tokens to someone else, you need to make sure uh, that the sender has so much tokens in its account. Otherwise, this transaction sh should be failed. And then you update the state. So by updating the state, you, you, you reduce the, the balance for the sender, and you add the balance into add, add the value into the, the receiver, then this transaction is updated by using the, the Merkle Patricia tree. So the whole pick, the whole flow uh, looks like this. If Alice wants to send 10 ABT to Bob, the first step is send this transaction, and uh, then this transaction will be broadcast to Tendermint, and then <coughs> uh, we will call the broadcast RPC for Tendermint. And then Tendermint will send a check transaction to your, to your, to your database engine. And then you can check the authentic, authenticity of that transaction. Meanwhile, Tendermint will synchronize uh, the data in its main pool to another node uh, across the internet. And once the consensus is made, uh, some node in the network made a new block and everyone else will got that block. Then Tendermint will start uh, do the begin, send the begin block event to your engine, and you can uh, handle that. And it will deliver transactions by transaction in sequence. And you need to make sure you process those transactions in sequence. Because here, you cannot do concurrency. Because uh, if you do transaction one uh, first, and someone else do transaction two first, then the, out, uh, the final state in the state DB will be completely different, and the harsh will be different. So you guys are uh, separated, uh, and the consensus is, is broken. So, um, so as a demo, uh, this looks to be very easy, but uh, if you want to do uh, a real-world 
decentralized database is pretty hard. You need to think uh, a lot of things. So uh, in Arcbox, we made this forge frameworks. Um, you, can, you can treat it as um, uh, Ruby on Rails for the web applications. Before Ruby on Rails, building a web application is very hard, very complicated. Uh, just as now, uh, when we want to build a decentralized application, it's very hard. We need some kind of framework to do heavy lifting, <coughs> lifting for us. So uh, Forge framework is for this purpose. And because of the time, I, I won't describe this. Uh, and uh, in the Forge framework, we, we stealed the nice concept of the plug in Elixir. So we made this pipeline for each transaction. So we, we build a lot of common uh, building blocks. You just need to, uh, to group them as a pipeline to make uh, your building a new transaction as easy as possible. And we also build an um, explorer, a, a web layer, to, to help you to explore the, explore the data easily. And we also build uh, a query language on top of it uh, using the GraphQL. So you can use the GraphQL, a standard GraphQL um, uh, playground to interact with the data uh, inside that database. And um, because we want to prove this, uh, this framework, this decentralized database can be used to build different uh, applications, to build usable applications, we, we build a very simple um, res, uh, reselling, uh, ticket reselling service, we call, call it Bazaar. And you can see here, if I want to, if I want to resell my, tic my code beam ticket, uh, I, just, I just need to put my ticket on, on here and put a price. And everyone else want to buy it, uh, it can just buy it. And it can, before buy it, it can, it can check the transaction is correct. And once it, it finished buying, the owner will be changed. And everything is trackable uh, in the, in the, either in the API or in the Explorer. Or you can even run a node yourself to, to fully synchronize the data and then check everything yourself. So this is, this will be very powerful. And we can easily uh, solve the problem like this. And currently, uh, for the status of Forge, uh, we, want, we hope to open source it in this conference, but uh, unfortunately, we haven't uh, uh, finished the, the final part. So uh, in a few weeks or a few months, depending on how we do our security testing, performance tuning, and stress testing to make sure everything uh, works well, we want to make sure the database can survive uh, for uh, billing transactions uh, for a, a small machine with enough disk space uh, to make sure it's use usable for the most common cases. And we will do a uh, uh, several uh, features to finish some several features before we, we publish it. So uh, in summary, the future is on um, decentralization. So data shall be owned by the owner, not by the application. Application might die, but the data should stay there forever. Um, and building a decentralized database shall be as easy as what we are doing now. We, we are pretty uh, familiar with Postgres, we, we know how to query data, we know how to update database. Building a new decentralized database shall be as easy as that. And public verifiable data and code will be the most important fact factor in the next generation web. So it's important. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, we have a blockchain experts here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.